Well, this morning, we're going to deal with what I think may very well be the most common sin among Christians. And my guess is that when you help me identify this here in just a moment, that you may be surprised at exactly what that sin is. Just a moment, I'm going to share with you a series of verses, and I'm going to ask you to, as I just read those, to think about what sin they might be pointing out. And as, as I do that, I just want to point out that every single one of these verses contains a command. And would you agree with me that when there's a command in Scripture, and we violate that command, that that's a sin? You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? So, so listen to each one of these commands, and see if you can identify what the, the common sin is among them. How about this one from Isaiah 41? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. From Matthew chapter 6, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. From Mark chapter 13. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. Luke chapter 12. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. Luke chapter 12. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Luke chapter 21, and when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. Finally, one last one, Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything. So what's the, what's the sin that's common to all these verses? What would you say that sin is? Okay. Worry. Yeah, you guys are all right there. It's worry. And, and as we read those passages, would you agree with me that worry is a sin, isn't it? The Bible's pretty clear about that. There, I, I could have given you at least that many more verses that talk about being anxious and fearful and terrified, which is really all just talking about worry. And frankly, there's a lot of reasons to worry in this world, aren't there? I mean, if you just think about it, there, there are legitimate reasons why we ought to worry. And there's a lot of people out there that are actually preying on our worries and, and who actually seem to want us to worry even more if you really get right down to it. Even some people who claim to be Christians, I think, get caught up in that sometimes. I was listening to a, a radio talk show host. This guy claims to be a Christian. And, and I was just, as I was listening, I began to think about all his sponsors. And every time that an ad would come on or every time he would promote a product, it was all about preying on our fears. I mean, they were, they were trying to sell food storage to prey on our fears of financial collapse. Trying to sell safes and, 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 and guns to, to help us help prey on our fear of, of harm to us and our fear of not being safe. Trying to sell us gold, again, to prey on our, our worry about financial things. It just seemed one thing after another. Everything was all about, about preying on the things that we have to worry about. Well, I promise you this morning, I'm not going to try to pile on to that. I'm not going to try to add to the things that you worry about because most of us have far too many things that we worry about already. What I want to do is to show you in the Bible that there's an antidote to that kind of worry. That antidote comes in a passage that we read earlier this morning in Psalm 23. It's really interesting to me. Just think for a moment, where do you usually hear Psalm 23? At funerals, right? Or memorial services? I think almost every time someone asks me to participate in one of those events, they, they want to have Psalm 23 included in there. Usually it's printed on the, the memorial folders. i got to tell you, when I die, I don't want Psalm 23 there because you know why? Psalm 23 is not a psalm about death. It's a psalm about living. It's a psalm about living the kind of fulfilled abundant, joyful, worry-free life that God wants us to have. That's really what this psalm is all about. It's interesting that out of all the pictures that David could have used when he wrote this psalm to speak about the relationship between God and, and us, that he chose this picture of sheep and shepherd. Now, that's not totally surprising because as a, as a young boy, David had spent his days being a shepherd out in the fields with his flocks. 
But David doesn't write this psalm, does he, from the perspective of the shepherd. But instead, what does he do? He puts himself in the place of the sheep. And he looks at, at the sheep and how, how they look at the shepherd who is taking care of them. We really don't know for sure exactly when David wrote this psalm. It, there's really nothing in the psalm that, that gives us that information specifically. But I think if you look at the context here, it's likely that he probably wrote it sometime later in his life. Probably when he was fleeing from some enemies. And David did that a lot of times in his life, didn't he? I mean, think about the time that he's fleeing from King Saul. And King Saul's out after him, chasing him, trying to kill him. Or even later in his life, as he got near the end of his life, his own son Absalom takes the throne by force. And he's out there leading his armies, trying to find David and kill him. And as David's in the midst of those kind of circumstances... He looks back on his life and he says, you know what? I have this good shepherd who's been taking care of me, who's been protecting me, who's been feeding me, who's been giving me rest. And he writes this beautiful psalm that begins with these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I think that verse really what it does, it sets the theme for the entire psalm really If you think about it, the rest of the psalm is all going to just kind of be adding explanation to what it means to have a good shepherd that makes sure that I don't have any needs in my life. And it's this verse that I think really gives us the antidote to worry as well. And here's what I would say that antidote is. If Jesus is my shepherd, then I have everything I need. If Jesus is my shepherd, then I have everything that I need. We're going to look at this verse in some detail, but, but before we do that, I need to talk a little bit about this whole idea of sheep and shepherds. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have any personal experience with sheep or being a shepherd. I don't really know what that's like, so I've had to do a lot of study to prepare for this series. And I've, I've looked at a lot of different resources, but probably the best one I found was this, this book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's written by a guy named Philip Keller. And Philip Keller actually spent eight years as a a shepherd in the Middle East, so he knows what it's like to be a shepherd. And he gives some wonderful insight into this psalm that that I don't think we can get unless we've been in his shoes. And so for the next six weeks as we go through this psalm, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the insights that that he shared because I think it really will help us. To understand this song. The idea of, of, of God being this good shepherd for his sheep, it's found all throughout the scriptures. As a matter of fact, in connections today, we're going to look in Ezekiel chapter 34 where it describes God being a shepherd for his people. And here's what Philip Keller has to write about this, this relationship between sheep and shepherds and why that's so appropriate for us to look at. He says this, It's no accident that God has chosen to call a sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Our mass mind or mob instincts, our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, our perverse habits are all parallels of profound importance. A few weeks ago on Monday morning, we talked about what sheep are like, and we talked about the fact that they're dependent, and they're dumb, and they're smelly. And that's what God is saying. That's what we are when we come to the presence of God. And that's why we need a shepherd. So with that in mind, let's look at this this first verse in a little detail. The first thing I want to do is to call your attention to the word shepherd there. Now, in in our English translations, the word shepherd, it looks like a noun. The Lord is my shepherd. But actually, if you go back to the underlying Hebrew in the Hebrew, that word shepherd is actually a verb. It's it's what we might call a verbal noun. So, So really, the translations we have... It's not that they're inaccurate in any way, but it might be better to actually translate that. If we wanted to translate that first verse really literally, we would translate it something like this. The Lord is the one shepherding me. That's really what what it's saying here. And I I like that translation because what it tells me, it tells me that God is actively involved in my life. Shepherd is not just a title for who he is, but shepherding is what he does in my life. God's involved in every single detail of my life. Watching over me and 
and caring for me and correcting me and helping me to grow in my relationship with Him because He is actively shepherding me day after day. He's not just my shepherd, He's shepherding me. Second thing I want us to look at is prob- I think the word that, that's the key to this entire psalm. Smallest word, I guess, or at least close to it in the entire psalm. Little two-letter word, my. The Lord is my shepherd. And what that tells us here is that this is, this is a personal psalm. David doesn't just say, the Lord is a shepherd. He doesn't even say the Lord is the shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I want you to, I want to encourage you over the next several weeks as we go through this series is to spend some time each week just reading through Psalm 23. And here's here's what I want to encourage you to do this week. I want you to check me out and see if I counted, right? But I want you to go through and I want you to look at the pronouns that are in this psalm. And, And if I counted right, and you can check me out on that, then what we find is that, that, uh, Actually, I'm going to come back to this a little later. But we find that that it's intensely personal here. And so the fact is, is, is if we want to be free from worry, not only does Jesus just need to be the shepherd, He needs to be my shepherd. And I want to share with you this morning some very, some very practical ways that we can make sure that that happens. Before we do that, though, I need to, to briefly look at the last part of this verse where it says, I shall not want. In that verse, David uses a a verb that means to be lacking or to be deficient and think about it without jesus is my shepherd my life is deficient isn't it it's lacking and what happens when my life is deficient and lacking i suffer loneliness i suffer chaos i suffer confusion all those kind of things that god doesn't want to be part of my life because there's something lacking there But on the other hand, if Jesus is my shepherd, as we've already seen this morning, then I have everything I need. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that Jesus is just going to give me everything I want in my life. I mean, if that was the kind of God we serve, he'd just merely be an idol, wouldn't he? He'd be a God of our own making. So Jesus isn't saying here is that if he's your shepherd, he'll give you everything you want. But he does promise to give us everything that we need in order to carry out His purposes and His plans and His ways in our life. See, if Jesus is my shepherd, then I have everything I need. And if I have everything I need, what is there to worry about? So obviously, there's only one long-lasting antidote to my worry, and that's to make sure that Jesus is my shepherd, that I can say right along with David that the Lord is my shepherd. So how do I do that? Let me share three things with you this morning. Three things, three ways that we can make sure that Jesus is my shepherd. The first one is I have to know him personally. As I pointed out just a moment ago, I kind of jumped ahead of myself, but I I encourage you, read the psalm this week. Look at the pronouns. And if I counted correctly, I find that in these 113 words of this psalm, that 17 times David uses the word I, I, me and my and then look at the other side of the coin in the first four three verses i believe it is he uses the words he and his five times to refer to god and then you'll notice something really interesting if you read the psalm when it gets to verse four david switches from talking about god to talking directly to god and now the pronouns pronouns he uses are you and your and i think there's five more times that you find that so this is This is an intensely personal psalm. This psalm is not about religion. And that's a good thing because guess what? No religion can take care of your worry. Only a relationship with Jesus can do that. And this is a psalm about a relationship with the shepherd. A couple of weeks ago when we were looking at this, maybe three or four weeks ago now on Monday morning, we Someone brought up this idea that God has no grandchildren. Think about that for a moment. It's true, isn't it? In our lives, we have grandchildren because our children have children. But in a spiritual sense, it doesn't work that way, does it? You cannot have a relationship with Jesus because your parents did. 
or because your brothers and sisters did. Or because somebody else in this church does. Or because your pastor does. It doesn't work that way. Each one of us, if we want to make Jesus our shepherd, we have to have that that personal relationship with God. And I'm not talking about the kind of relationship that's merely just reciting some prayer. The words to a prayer. Or joining a church. I'm talking about the kind of relationship in which we really get to know Jesus personally. Listen to the words of Jesus Himself when He talks about this idea of being our shepherd. Here's what He said in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And here's the key part. And my own know me. Jesus says if you're one of His sheep, then you will know Him. And it's really interesting. The word that He uses there for know, there's a bunch of different Greek words. This one means to to come to know by experience. It's not the kind of knowledge we can have about Jesus from, from just reading a book or, or, or even coming to church. That, that's all part of it. But it's the kind of, a, of knowledge that comes through, through an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the kind of knowledge that comes from living our lives day by day in obedience to Him, carrying out His purposes and His plans and His ways in our lives. And I think there's a very simple test that all of us can apply to determine whether, in fact, we really know Jesus personally, that we have that kind of relationship with Him. Here's that test. The next time that you start to worry about something, your finances, your marriage relationship, your work situation, your safety, where do you go first to look for solutions to that worry? Where do you go first? If you truly have this shepherd relationship with Jesus Christ, this intimate relationship, then you're going to take those problems to Him first. But if your relationship isn't genuine, then you may say you're taking your problems to Jesus. You may say you're taking your worries, but in reality, here's what you'll do. If you have financial problems, you'll immediately go to Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman. You have relationship problems. You go to James Dobson or Dr. Phil or Oprah. If you have problems at work, you'll go to John Maxwell or or Stephen Covey or Warren Buffet. If you have safety issues, you'll go to Smith & Wesson. (laughs) Now, it's certainly possible that Jesus will lead you to use some of those resources. That, That... I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those people or any of those resources. It might be very prudent, as a matter of fact, to use some of them from time to time. But here's what I'm saying. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to go to Him first. You're going to turn to Him first. And if you really know that Jesus is your shepherd, if you really trust Him as your shepherd, then that's that's the most logical thing that you can do. So that's a great test. See, because if Jesus is your shepherd then you have everything that you need. And the first thing I have to do if I want Jesus to be my shepherd is to make sure I know Him personally. Here's the second thing I have to do. I have to give Him control of my life. Probably the hardest part. If you take nothing else out of this message today, I want you to hear this. The Lord can't be your shepherd until the shepherd is your Lord. Did you get that? The Lord can't be your shepherd until the shepherd is your Lord. The two go hand in hand. You can't say, Jesus, I want you to be my shepherd, but but you can't be my Lord. It doesn't work that way. The two go hand in hand. They're inseparable. We talk a lot about making Jesus our Lord, but but what does that really look like? How How does that work in my life? Well, think about the relationship between a sheep and the shepherd. As we're going to see over the coming weeks, The shepherd determines what's good for the sheep. And then he's in charge of that. The shepherd determines where they're going to go eat and where they're going to find water. The shepherd determines which path they're going to take. The shepherd protects them and watches over them. The shepherd disciplines them and corrects them when they need that. And he does that all unilaterally. He doesn't get all the sheep together and say, Hey, sheep, let's vote on where we're going to go eat today. It's not like, 
our family when we try to decide where we're going to go to lunch after church. We've decided we should probably go build a restaurant that was called the I don't know or the I don't care because that's where we go all the time. But, but that's not how the shepherd operates. The shepherd unilaterally determines what's good for the sheep. And me making Jesus my Lord, it means that I give him control of every single area of my life. I let him call the shots. I trust him to determine which of the difficult situations in my life that I need to go through and which of them that I need to go around. I trust Jesus to figure that out on my behalf. I don't make that decision myself. I trust him to determine exactly what I need to follow his purposes and his plans and his ways for my life. And then to provide whatever I need to do that. Again, let me suggest a couple of tests that you can apply in your life. I think these are real practical to determine. Have you really given Jesus control of your life? Here's the, here's the first test. Whenever we fear, whenever we get anxious, whenever we worry, there's two things we can do. We can panic or we can pray. And guess which of the two happens when you give Jesus control of your life? You pray, right? When our checkbook balance is down to zero and and we don't know where the next money can come from, we can panic and we can run down to Title Max and take out a loan, or we can pray. When our marriage is falling apart or we're having difficulties there, we can run down and we can panic and go to the divorce lawyer, or we can pray. When there's a terror attack or a school shooting, we can panic and go down and buy a gun and a whole bunch of ammunition, or we can pray. When we have a presidential election in which we're faced with the choice between two ungodly people, we can panic or we can pray. Again, God may use some of those other things, but, but again, what do you do first? Do you panic or do you pray? If Jesus is in control of my life, then prayer will be my first response, not my last resort. Here's the second test. Do you regularly spend time in God's Word, both on your own and with other people? See, if Jesus is in control of your life, you're going to love God's Word. You're not going to read it because it's some kind of duty or obligation. You're going to do it because you can't wait to get in here and find out what Jesus has for your life. God guides us in a lot of ways. We just talked about prayer. He, the Holy Spirit lives within us. But you know what? The primary way that God's going to guide us is through His Word. And nothing else that He leads us to do will ever conflict in any way with what He's given us in His written Word. So, so we ought to love to spend time in His Word, both on, by our, on our own and with other people. That's why we have opportunities each week for you to gather together with other men, with other women, with other people. And, and study and read God's Word together. You ought to be doing that together in your families. We spent some time in our men's breakfast talking about the need for us as fathers, especially in our homes, to be, to be leading our family to spending time in God's Word together. See, at its foundation, worry is really a control issue. If you think about it, worry is nothing more than trying to control the uncontrollable. And guess what? If we give up all the control to Jesus, then again, there's nothing for us to worry about. Because if Jesus is my shepherd, then I have everything I need. But since the Lord can't be the shepherd until the shepherd is my Lord, that means I have to give up control of my life to Jesus. Here's the third thing that we have to do. We have to be satisfied with his provision. I mean, you know, how, you know why David could write, I shall not want? He did that because he trusted completely in God's provision. He trusted that whatever God gave him, that that was enough for his life. And he was completely satisfied with that. He understood that as the good shepherd, God has committed himself to our highest good. God loves us. He wants the very best for us. And David trusted in that. And he trusted that, that God would provide for all of our needs, not just our material needs, but our emotional needs, and most importantly, of all our spiritual needs. About a thousand years after David wrote those words, I shall not want, the Apostle Paul comes along, and he writes something very similar to that. Here's what he wrote in Philippians chapter 4. And my God 
will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So according to that verse, that verse, how many of our needs does God promise to meet? All of them, every single one. So whatever need you have in your life, Jesus is, God has promised to meet that in Jesus Christ. And every means every. There's no exceptions to that. And since that is the case, then the implication is I need to be satisfied with whatever God has chosen to give me in my life. We don't always live like that, do we? I'll admit, far too many times in my life, I get unsatisfied with what God has given me. So what do I do? I go and pray, God, give me something else. Or even worse, I go out and try to get it on my own. And what usually happens when I finally get something that God has chosen not to provide me, and I've gone out and I've done it on my own, I finally discover why God didn't give it to me in the first place is because it wasn't what was best for my life. Once again, let me share, I think, what's a simple test to find out if you're really satisfied with God's provision in your life. When you pray, do you spend more time thanking God for what He's already provided for you? Or do you spend more time asking Him for more? Now, there is obviously nothing wrong with praying and asking God for things, to, to pray for health, to pray about our... Fun. We've already talked a lot about praying. But here's the thing. If, if you're satisfied with what Jesus has given to you, you're going to spend a lot of time thanking Him for what He's already given to you, aren't you? Instead of just going out and asking for more and, and more and more. God is not just some big genie in the sky who's there to give us our every wish. Because He knows what we need and He's promised to give us what we need. So when you pray, where, where do you spend most of your time praying? If Jesus is my shepherd, then I have everything I need. And when I have everything that I need, there's no need for me to worry about what I don't have. What are you worried about this morning? Are you worried about your finances? Are you worried about your relationships with your spouse or with your children? Are you worried about your job? Are you worried about your safety? Are you worried about worrying? <laughs> Probably, if we're honest, all of us would say, yeah, we have some of those worries. But here's the good news. There's an antidote to that. The antidote is making sure that the shepherd is your Lord. Because then the Lord will be your shepherd. And He'll provide everything you need. And when we have everything that we need, then there's no need to worry. Let's pray.